Hi, hello, hey there. This is the Product Uncensored Show with your host, Colin Bell. That is me, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know. This is the show where we talk about all things product with product people focusing on Southeast Asia. At least that's what we try to do most of the time. This is episode five today, which means that you have four more to go if this is your first time watching or listening. If this is not your first time, fantastic. Welcome back. And I really hope that you've clicked on the subscribe and like button. The likes and the subscribes um, really help to give this show a wider reach. And more importantly, it lets me know that you folks are enjoying the content. If you prefer listening to our podcasts, do listen to our episodes on Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple. The links will be in the description. Now, before I start, I would just like to thank, you know, um, friends, peers, supporters, everyone who has reached out to give me feedback or just to voice your support. I really just wanted to say it means a lot. So thank you, terima kasih, and kamsia. Of course, on the Product Uncensored show, every episode is special. And today is no different because we have got a guest who is well-respected in the Southeast Asian scene, a yet another well-traveled product leader. And today, he's joining me all the way from Amsterdam. Welcome to the show, Andreas Baranowskis. Hey. Hello, Colin. Uh, Did I get I'm, the name I'm right? Super excited. <laughs> Did I get the surname right? <laughs> Yes, yes, oh. more or less right. Like it's, it's really, really close. And I don't know how difficult it is. Like I still remember talking with security in every building in Singapore and then trying to pronounce my surname from the IC. It, it wasn't the easiest exercise. So yes. I do appreciate the effort. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, as I was mentioning just now, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show and welcome to the show. So um, we're going to jump straight into things today. Um, I, I, I've got like really, really interesting topics that I want to cover. You've got a really interesting CV, um, but maybe you can start by just, you know, letting our listeners know, you know, a little bit about who you are and where you're from, what you do. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So um, I originally come from Lithuania, which is a small country in Eastern Europe. Uh, northern Europe, like we, we try to move ourselves with time a bit, like where, where do we belong, like, uh, and um, I also enjoyed spending uh, a bit more than three years in Singapore, like, uh, and that's that's how we got connected with Colin. Right now, I'm based in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, um, and here I work at Booking.com, which is the uh, uh, world's uh, very largest online travel company. And uh, my responsibility at booking is uh, overseeing a couple of product cars uh, in pricing area. Like, uh, um, so this is me. Like, and um, I think we'll we'll delve into a bit more of what I do and, and uh, where I come from in uh, kind of the further parts of, of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you, thank you. That was a very very concise summary. So. Folks, you definitely know that this man knows how to keep time. So this is really fantastic. All right. So we're going to start with the first one and I'm going to jump straight into it because um, like I said, your CV is so interesting. You actually spent um, seven years in this company called Neo Symmetria. Um, is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. That's right. That's right. And, and the very interesting part is you are actually a product person or a product leader who actually has experience being a project manager as well. Um, yes. So, and the interesting, the, actually the more interesting part is you start off as a junior designer, then project mm -hmm. manager, and then went into yeah. account uh, to become an account director, which pretty much to me, it sounds like really very different roles. Uh, and I would really like to understand, you know, how did you get your break doing uh, as a junior designer? And then again, how did you make that switch to project management? Sure, sure. Colin, is it, is it okay if I start even earlier? Like, because I think the context of, you know, how I even got to that uh, point of being a junior designer it might be important. Uh, yeah, to, no, no, you cannot. Yeah. Um, of course you can. This is, this is, <laughs> you are the guest, you are the star. Sure, 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 sure. So look, like, I was, I was lucky to grow up uh, in a, at home uh, where, you know, one of my parents, my father was an engineer. Like, and, um, which meant that 
I got uh, very early exposure to computers. Like, uh, so I think at age four or, or something, I was already playing text-based uh, games uh, at my father's workplace and stuff. Like, uh, um, but I've always resisted my kind of father's uh, uh, wish to code and uh, kind of try to do some engineering work and stuff like. Uh, um, my most favorite uh, app on, on on the computer was uh, uh, the paintbrush app, like, and then later paint and so on to to draw and and and, and things like that. Although I was never really good at that, like. Um, um, and what what happened was uh, maybe in a very interesting way when I was a kid. Like I was, I think, sixteen at the time. Like. Uh, um, uh, through some people that I knew, I got a freelance job. Like I got a freelance job to design posters and flyers for a nightclub, like uh, the best and the most favorite nightclub in my city. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so this was my first break and first uh, kind of thing to 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 make money. Like, uh, and at the same time, like um, I got really interested in uh, in the internet, like, and I've. Uh, uh kind of started to use it started to use email started to use web and these these were pretty early day, days of, of the internet i think back in 97 98 99 and um, um somehow i started to code as well like um, and my, my coding started was uh, was very silly in a way because um i first had to have a goal and then i could learn how to code something like I couldn't just learn to code something for the sake of coding. Like, uh, so one of the first things that I did was um, uh, kind of doing a common line uh, email app, like uh, just to allow me to send uh, um, emails from uh, floppy disks that they would bring to Internet Cafe, and to download the emails back to the floppy disk. Like, um, and the reason behind it was that. Uh, uh, I could go to the internet cafe then every day, like jump in for like five minutes, pay nothing, and I didn't have a lot of money at the time, like, uh, and then go back home and uh, write these emails, like, and then mm -hmm. go back to the internet cafe the next day and so on, like. Uh, so that's uh, that. That was how I uh, learned a bit of engineering. Then I started to 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 see that hey, there is this thing called websites. I can do one, and with another person, I created a website around Formula One. Uh, so this is how I, I learned more and more about engineering, and that was Perl at the time. Like, uh, so Perl and and uh, CGI bin and uh, all of that nonsense uh, was was my start with. Uh, oh, it's not nonsense! Yeah. It allowed you to go to the internet cafe <laughs> and not pay anything and send your emails. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I I really had to have like a goal in mind, like. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and this, this led me to, you know, another thing where I, I started to freelance, uh, for some engineering work as well. I still remember creating, um, uh, kind of a marketplace for, uh, shipping, uh, which meant that, you know, I was connect connecting people who needed to ship stuff with the shipping providers, but I mean like big shipping providers, like freighters, uh, where, uh, there is a big, big, uh, Kind of uh, car, big truck, uh, transporting goods, and, and you connect people with goods with people who have these uh, these big trucks. Like, uh, um, and I still remember being paid like I think four hundred uh, dollars or something for for the whole marketplace. <laughs> but that would have been uh, big money that, at that time, right? Yeah, I was I was sixteen, seventeen. For me, it was it was big money. Like, um, so uh, you know, with, with time passing and me finishing school, like uh, I learned uh, and I knew a bit of design, I knew a bit of engineering, and um, I thought that I know enough. I know enough of the technical stuff. Like uh, the world is my oyster, but uh, first I need to understand how you know what power is the real world. Like uh, so, um, and I end up uh, studying economics, like um, in the in the university. Uh, but I never went to work for a bank or, or some other financial institution. Like um, I started to work in tech uh, full time, I think in my second year in the uni. Um, and, um, and this was the junior design uh, kind of position, uh, uh, which was a mix of design work as well as front end engineering work. So I was doing HTML, I was doing JavaScript, and I was also designing uh, things uh, in a limited scope, uh, uh, but still, uh, it was something that was playing to the skills that I acquired uh, back in school. Like, uh, uh, 
but uh, with my background uh, in the, uh, more on the business side as well as uh, you know the mix of technical skills, I was very quickly given an opportunity to do project management. Like uh, it was pretty easy for me because I knew how the bread is made. Like um, and I, I could look into different streams of work and organize that work. Like. Um, and this was an agency, like, and in the agency world, like, you know, project management and account management are two things that are extremely close. Like, so you manage an account, yes. and account has multiple projects, um, and so you go and, and and do a lot of account management as well, um, inbound sales and and and, and so on. Like, and then I, I quickly progressed to to a role that was uh, uh, called account accounts director, like, uh, mm-hmm. which essentially looked after. The key accounts as well as oversaw other accounts that project yeah. managers like uh, yeah i'm sorry just uh, wanted to just step in for a bit um when you say yeah. account management here and you're working for a um agency right so i'm assuming yeah. accounts here would basically mean each client um so each a client yeah. is considered an account right yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so just That's just true. some context for for the listeners or the <laughs> viewers sorry please carry on yeah yeah, so so this is this is how I got into the project management line. Yeah. Okay, okay. In the meantime, I was still I was still coding and designing, you know, some stuff on the side. I still had my formal one website that I continue to maintain and, and write code for. Uh, so I I never escaped like that that kind of more technical world for quite a while after <laughs> I went into project management line. Yeah. Um, and I got some very interesting projects to work on, like and. Uh, that uh, started to to bring me more to the product management side as well. Like, um, so I had an opportunity to work with Nokia back in two thousand six, two thousand eight, and we were we were doing like very, I'd say, novel uh, things. Like, uh, because Nokia understood that the web is not great at that time, mobile web. Like, mm-hmm. uh, and and it was looking into apps and how to create apps for media companies such as New York Times, Al Jazeera, and and and, and so on. Like. Uh, um, uh, that was a, a bit ahead of its time, like, but it showed me kind of the product creation and product world, and not just you know the website for brands and so on. Like, yeah. um, and 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 it got me attracted to to the other side of the business too. Okay, okay. So um, from there, actually, you went on to do product management for was it a startup called Eskimi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, okay, that's correct. All right. So. Yeah, like, um, sorry, I just wanted to to just get a bit of more understanding. Um, when you went to Eskimi as a product manager, were you already aware of the differences between product management and the project management role that you previously played? Or was it because you were just very interested in the product that Eskimi had to offer? I was to be to be honest, like the the way it happened was that uh, as a lot of I think folks at that time, I, I discovered uh, sites like TechCrunch uh, and so on. Like that, that was the coolest thing on the internet back then. Like mm-hmm. uh, I discovered the world of startups, and also discovered the role itself. But uh, I have never kind of faced in the path like the product manager role, like, but it answered to kind of. Uh, a thing I had in my head that I move, wanted to move to, like, and the, the the key thing for me was actually to step to the other side, like, because I was I was project management, uh, my, managing things before I was account managing things, like, which mm-hmm. meant that, you know, a uh, client somewhere has that did the customer research knows what they want to build, like, and then they come to me and say, hey, you you do and build it, like, and you may have you know other ideas and and so on, and sometimes these ideas get incorporated, like. But you want at some point you want to go to the other side. You want to to be the one uh, who plays a bigger part and bigger role in terms of discovering what they built. That for me was product management. Like, right. That's that's how I ended up in in, in that space. Okay. And and did you feel like um, or, or rather maybe I should ask it. So let me ask it in a different way. Yeah. What was the biggest difference? What was or sorry? What were the biggest differences that you found between project management and product management? when you first joined, uh, joined Eskimi? Because um, I know you already uh, alluded a, a bit to that. You already said that, yes, you know, uh, project management is basically after the discovery has, uh, has been done. But did you find any other differences? I, I think I'll have a very uh, strange answer to your question. Like, I found product management to be 
project management and more. <laughs> that was my kind of initial initial experience. Like mm-hmm. uh, because uh, you know when I joined the startup, like first you need to wear a multiple hats. Like so automatically, as someone having project management experience, I was doing project management too. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, but here I had the chance to do product management, so I had the chance uh, first, uh, um, uh, you know, to decide what to build. Like that was that was in my hands. Like. Uh, uh, but then I was also shown that, you know, I can't just dream about things from, you know, nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like, so um, I was taught uh, user, user research, uh, you know, talking with the customer and then things like that. So, so these were the two key, key differences for me from yeah. kind of project management world. Mm-hmm. Like, but I still had to do the project management as well. Yes. Like, that, that was yeah. my natural state of things then. Okay. And in SKME, were, were there project managers as well? Or was there only the product management function, which also co-opted the project management functionality? Yeah, we, I think we didn't have like any proper project managers. Like we, yeah. we were, uh, there were two of us product managers, like, and we were really overseeing the project management side. Of things. Yeah. I was actually seeing that trend for quite a while still after. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and then only later, like this, this truly evolves where uh, a lot of project management is actually taken care of from by your engineering counterparts. Like, but back then it seemed like that, you know, project management is, is essentially part of the job. Like that's, that, that was the perception. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's great to hear from someone who has the experience. I actually shared an article a few days back about how um, it wasn't written by me. It was just uh, an article that I found, which I really resonated with about how um, product managers um, actually find themselves um, functioning as project managers um, and, and that had I don't know for some reason it, it, had, it brought a lot of supporters and also people who felt that you know that that article was not being fair so um, you know knowing that your, your CV includes project management I really wanted to know from someone who has done both as well so yes thank you for that uh, now moving along to, to your role in Eskimi now Eskimi was an Africa centric mobile first social network um is that right yeah, yeah okay so yeah. one of the things i wanted to find out from you was so you were working out of lithuania which is you know europe and it was a uh, africa centric did were you did you have any issues in terms of trying to localize the product um because um i, I don't know what kind of yeah or rather what kind of localization problems did you face trying to build a product for an african continent yeah, like um, I think maybe first how we ended up in Africa, like because that that is important piece, and I think it, it mm-hmm. describes how how do you localize things. Like, so when I joined the Skimmy, we were a product that was used in Lithuania by about a hundred thousand people, uh, which is big because Lithuania overall is like three point five million, so uh, hundred thousand audience is is, is quite uh, reasonable. Like. Uh, but then, like, uh, what the founders um, uh, thought about was global expansion. And the way to do global expansion at the time was, uh, and the attitude was pretty simplistic, like, you know, here's the budget, like, and uh, let's try spending, you know, 200 euros per market and seeing what kind of traction can we get in, the, in each market. And then based on that, we will double down and invest more and, and see how, how can we grow in, in, in each of them. Like, uh, so we've tried our luck in many, many markets like uh, Central America, South America, Southeast Asia, um, Africa, and so on. Like, and we had a product which was essentially a mobile web, like uh, very low bandwidth, um, uh, low tech, uh, but something that worked. Something uh, that also was addressing needs that uh, were not addressed by Facebooks of the world and so on. Like it was a social network. Like, uh, and naturally, we started to get traction in uh, Central America, Africa, Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, the biggest uh, success was actually uh, Africa, and um, especially English-speaking markets like Nigeria, Kenya, and so on. Uh, um, South, uh, Southeast Asia at that time actually had an alternative already, which was MIGMI. Like, uh, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think there were alternatives as well in, in, in uh, South America. And, almost nothing in Africa, like, so um, that, that was an interesting kind of blue ocean uh, yeah. over there, like, that we could expand it to, like, uh, uh, so uh, in reality, then what happened is that uh, it wasn't that we localized the product to market, like, but we found the market where the existing product actually works, like, uh, 
that. Mm -hmm. And then we double down, like then we double down and try to understand the market, try to speak to the customers there um, and, and look into things that are very local. And uh, always, you know, the hard, the, not the hardest like, but the uh, thing that you need to localize, otherwise your product does not work. I think like payments um, and um, connectivity to existing uh, model uh, kind of service providers and so on. Like. So, so this is where a lot of uh, uh, localization work went, is trying to understand what is the best way for people to pay, how best to work with the uh, phone operators and, and mm -hmm. uh, local partners in the market. Uh, but it was tough because we were doing this all from from Lithuania, and we haven't traveled to uh, Nigeria, which was the biggest market for almost a year uh, since we kind of decided that hey, this is this is the top market for us, like, uh, um, and and that had its cost, like, because at some point we actually ran out of money, and I, as a product manager, I was fired from my first job, like, uh, oh. just because we, we we that 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 kind of thing happened, like, so. Uh, after a year of product management career, my career was almost over. Uh, but luckily, uh, attraction was so good that uh, the company started to make money, and three months later, we hired me back into, uh, into its roster. Like, wow! Wow! That that's a super. What oh, that, that that's just crazy. That that's the craziest product management <laughs> story I've heard. You know, one year into product management, you do well, but then you get fired. But because you know the lagging indicators then meant that you guys were starting to make money, suddenly they can hire you back. Yeah. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. But it, it sounds yeah, but, like... Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think like, you know, an important part here is that, you know, after a year in product management, I don't think I was doing so well. Like, because as, as I mentioned before, like there were, there were two of us, like, and, uh, you know, the company didn't shut down. Like they fired like a few people and I was one of them and that the product manager was not fired. Like, so it means I, I was not that good. Like, uh, <laughs> um, um, but it was a it was a good lesson, and uh, I think I'm very lucky that I kept on this track. Like, uh, hmm. um, because they were, you know, I was offered the role of being head of sales in the in the agency world, like, uh, and I could have very easily went to that role, like, uh, but I didn't. Like, so I think yeah, it was uh, a bit of that was my own decision making, but I think a lot of that was also pure luck. Okay. Okay. Um, so, sorry, just going back to the localization piece, it sounds mm -hmm. like um, you, the, the, the company didn't do or didn't have to uh, localize languages in that sense. So you just went to African uh, markets where they spoke English as well as their medium of communication. Yeah, we, we did have to localize like in terms of the language as well, like um, because um, you know, in Nigeria, the English is not, uh, it's not like, uh, UK English or US English like uh, um, and uh, so I think Singapore has uh, uh, Singlish right like yeah uh, yeah so in uh, in the kind of in Nigeria you have also the local local English like uh, Niger English and, and and so on so you need to adapt to that and you need to have variations of language for for, for different markets like uh, but it's less of a challenge because you still kind of, as a product person, right? Like you still can look at the product and understand what's there. Like, mm -hmm. because in, uh, in some cases, like when we were doing Indonesia, for example, and we were doing Bahasa for Indonesia, like we just couldn't understand, like what, what, what is the product about? So this leads to errors. This leads to things where you don't really translate well to represent what, what you're actually doing and so on. So uh, doing things in English for us was much, much easier. Like, yes. and I think that led to uh, more success. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, and then coming back to the part where you said, you know, you sort of got fired from, from that job. Do you think that it was something, you know, in hindsight, do you actually think mm -hmm. that it was something that was good or because I mean, some of them, um, some people say that, you know, having a wake up call early in your career is better rather than having late in your career. So like if you got fired, you kind of realize that, hey, maybe I'm not, I'm not as good as I thought I was. Maybe some people may think that or that, you know, like, hey, I have to work harder in that sense. Yeah, I think this was, this was a good wake up call. Like, and uh, you understand that you have to work harder and you also understand that you need to spend a bit more time doing things that you may not like. like uh, uh, just to do the, uh, you know, the overall thing that you like, like, so, you know, in any job, there is like probably 50% of the stuff or 60% of the stuff that you may not like, like, but you do it for like 20% of the things that you like, like, 
Um, uh, so that was that was an important piece. I think a lot of things came came together for me in, in that year. Like uh, uh, my my father died soon soon after as well. Like so, there were like a lot of wake up calls in in, in one package. Like uh, mm -hmm. that probably created a lot of uh, acceleration uh, going forward as well. Like um, um, and I think one another interesting thing that you know happened after is that you became become a lot less afraid of being fired uh, uh from any job after like uh, mm. after you, you have it like so that's uh, that's an interesting takeaway like at least for me yeah that that is you know that's some great insight there and, and i'm really <laughs> sorry to to hear about your your dad's passing as well my condolences um okay okay um, so let let's then move move ahead into your role at Vinted, um, and this mm -hmm. is where you started off as the product manager for the the mobile product, um, yeah. and then you actually moved on to become the head of product uh, at Vinted. So the question for you at this uh, juncture of your career is, how did you make that jump from being a product manager? To becoming a, a sort of a product leader in that sense, um, one who is heading the entire product. Yeah, like um, I think maybe to to start with, like uh, Vinted back then was a very small company, like um, and uh, the kind of the unicorn it is now, like it is much bigger, like compared to the, those days, like and. Uh, I started to engage with the company earlier. Like so, when I was fired, I did some consulting for 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 them. Like, uh, uh, and then the the group was like five people or six people. Everyone could go to lunch together in an easy way and still hold the conversation. And that's how I remember it, the, kind of the first interaction with the, with the team. Um, and I joined Vinted uh, to launch a mobile app. Like, uh, and the marketplace was desktop only, but used by very young people. Like. Uh, uh, and um, with the hindsight, it was it was pretty easy to understand that you know they will jump on that mobile app very very fast, so, and that's what happened. Like after we launched mobile apps, six months later, uh, mobile became the main uh, channel for us um, as a company to both the first transactions, new listings coming into the marketplace, and so on. Like, uh, and that kind of transition to product leadership was very natural. Like um, I actually worked side by side with the, the original head of product, uh, Nurida, uh, at that time. Like uh, and uh, and she, but her uh, kind of strength was always in the, on the research side. Like she was coming from the research background, and she complemented me very well when I could look into and oversee a lot of more technical things and, and execution itself and so on. Like, uh, mm -hmm. um, so because of model success, my transition to product leader was 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 very natural. Like, uh, and what came with it were, were a lot of challenges like that need, needed to be solved like without even being called the product leader at that time like so uh, we launched mobile apps with external uh, companies like so we had external contractors developing apps for us like uh, and then suddenly apps are the main and core uh, channel for us like so we needed to develop that muscle inside the company um, I, I needed to hire engineers I need to hire designers who have some experience with mobile and and then uh, another problem to solve was how do we structure ourselves? Like how do we uh, make sure that we um, can run fast but take care of all the platforms? Like uh, which led us to uh, adopt approach where we have cross-functional teams uh, uh, without actually knowing that Spotify is doing the same uh, at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and so on. like, so, so that transition was pretty natural and it felt as well temporary in a way, like, uh, because when I nominally became, became head of product, like, um, I started to attend board meetings, um, and, uh, and I was very impressed. Like, this was like a very, very good school for me. Like, uh, I was, uh, enter a board meeting, I sit for like two or three hours and I just absorb life, uh, because there's so many clever people, uh, talking and seeing things very differently and that was that was a great school there was another thing in, in, in uh, at least a few of the board meetings the, at, the, at the start like so we meet every three months and um, all the slides are very interesting all the conversations are very interesting but the end, at the end of the meeting we, we there's always a slide like you know uh, called the CPO search like um, so 
uh, and and the uh, topic of discussion is you know how to find the real uh, product leader who has the experience and uh, who who did their own share of work in the marketplace and so on. Like. And we had people coming from um, US, uh, mostly uh, people who had experience with eBay, HomeAway, and other like uh, really well-known companies. Um, and uh, you know, in some cases uh, they were not that great. Like, um, and in some cases they were they were really great and uh, would have uh, probably achieved uh, uh, big things like. Uh, but they just didn't didn't want to move uh, to 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 the country. Like they were googling where is Lithuania, and like uh, there's not the tech companies here, nothing. Like so, <laughs> I think I, I got lucky again in that regard. Like um, to be given a, a chance, like to continue, like to to lead and to grow with the company. Um, uh, that was uh, that was luck too. Like, mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Again, very, very interesting. I read, I'm, I'm so mesmerized by your story. Um, yeah. So, so let's, let's carry on, on, on this journey, right? Because from Vintert, that's where you moved to Singapore and Carousel. How, how yeah. did that come about? What, what happened? <laughs> um, so there was, uh, this one board member, like, uh, back at Vintert, uh, uh, his name was Mikhail and he, he was from Excel, like, uh, and um, he, uh, he was one of the uh, more influential persons, I think, in my career, like, and, and really helped with his focus to the numbers. Um, and uh, I think his uh, real world attitude as well, that I have a lot to learn. Like, uh, and um, uh, he encouraged my learning in interesting ways, like, so. He was asking me, like, you know, where do I go next? Where do I travel? Where is my next holiday? Like, uh, so, for example, when I was going to Israel, I said to him, hey, I'm going to Tel Aviv for a week. Like, so he asked, like, you know, do you have a free afternoon or something? Like, so I, like yeah, I said, like, I, I should have. Like, so let me connect you with people in, in Israel, like, um, who work in the marketplace space and, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, similar spaces and where you could learn from, like, you know, for other product leaders or CEOs and stuff like um, so this is this was my first trip that way, and I went there for holiday. But I spent like four hours talking to people from Fiverr, uh, Billgard, a few other companies. I ended up visiting uh, Israel Defense Ministry. Uh, I had to give up my passport, everything to get in. So that was a very interesting trip in many mm -hmm. ways. Like, but that taught me as well, kind of developed habit in me to meet with local marketplace people, local startup folks, uh, uh, almost everywhere I go. Like. Um, so when I uh, was planning to go to Singapore in Japan back in 2015, I went to Singapore to see an F1 race, like um, actually first F1 race of my life, like although I was having a website for like almost 20 years about it, like I've never seen a race before. Um, uh, so in Singapore, I scheduled two meetings. Uh, one was with uh, Carousel and another one was with, with Rihanna. Like, so I called uh, message Suri, like, uh, and we ended up like scheduling a half an hour meeting. Like, uh, so I come to 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 Carousel's office, uh, and that is that is 2015. Um, uh, it's it's still quite small, block 71, um, around 30 people in the company, and uh, um, because it's a half an hour meeting, I you know my wife joins me as well, and she'll wait and so on. Like, and that meeting, uh, we, we have a lot to talk about, like, uh, and, uh, and it's also like, you know, there is a vibe from, from the get-go, like, uh, um, and it's, it's a very good conversation. I think our meeting lasted for two hours, maybe even more, like, so my wife said that they knock in the, in, the, in, the, in the door, like, you know, what, what the hell, like, <laughs> um, so, uh, so that was a good conversation, and, and that's, that's where things stopped, like, but then, like, you know, bit less than a year later when I started to think about what to do next. When I wanted to get more international exposure, I reached out to the network and uh, uh, Suri and the team were looking for someone to lead product as well. And uh, we naturally matched like, and, and I ended up moving to, to Singapore. Uh, that's, that's roughly the story. <laughs> okay, okay. And moving from Lithuania to Singapore mm -hmm. isn't exactly a short journey in that sense. So. Yeah. For you, was there any hesitancy to move or was it because, you know, 
were you looking to sort of embed yourself in the Southeast Asian scene or was it purely because, hey, you know, I like Carousel. There was, you know, some chemistry there and I think we can work together. What was it that made you take that leap from the comfort of your home country to move halfway around the world to a different hemisphere in Singapore? Um, I think a few things like... Um... Maybe first and, uh, and the most important is uh, when I went to interview with Kirsten and I spent a day with the team, like uh, I, I felt uh, immediately, I know, at home. Um, yeah, I think the way the environment is really Marcus and Lucas created, like it's, uh, it was a very welcoming environment. And as well, like, you know, it, it didn't seem to be, hey, this is like a very different culture or this is a very different uh, way of working. Um, it seemed to be close enough where I could say, hey, I can actually belong and I can uh, as well be successful. Like, uh, I also saw that I can contribute to. Like, so that, that created that, that feeling which made me kind of sure that this is the, the best thing I can do. Like, uh, and... Uh, you know, the other alternatives in Europe, like Berlin, or, or there was a remote alternative as well, but about New York, and, and, and I think about it, like, this seemed to be much better. This seemed to be a clear fit, and, and so on. And I think, you know, looking backwards, like, yeah, I, could, I could really use and uh, bring a marketplace knowledge and, you know, market building skills to the company. So there was some strong base that I was coming in with, and uh, but as well, uh, there was an opportunity to, for me to learn, to learn Southeast Asia and to learn the region that was growing very fast. Like, um, and I got intrigued by the by the region, like uh, even even before. So uh, that was uh, a match where you you have something strong to bring, and but at the same time, there's there's something for you to learn, which I think is always a good combination when you think about in the next step in in, in, in career. Like, Mm. Um, um, so yeah, that's, that's how I ended up at Carousel. Okay. And when you came in, you came in as the director of product, were you the first, yeah. um, product leader that was hired? Um, I think there, there were product people in the company before, like, um, mm. when I joined the company, like when we, there were three people on the product team, four with me, like, um. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hui uh, was with the team for a very long time, like, uh, and um, she was uh, someone who grew with the company and grew successfully. She went from customer experience role to the product role, and uh, was bringing you know the customer understanding, um, and uh, especially you know the first uh, carousel user understanding and so on. Like, um, uh, the two other uh, people in in the team were very new, like so they joined the company two two months uh, or two weeks before I joined, like okay. so so the team in, in general was very fresh, like and I was taking the product leadership from Syria directly, like so from from the CEO, like that mm -hmm. was a transitional moment I think for the product management in the company. Okay, yeah, so let's jump into that part because um, again, I think I covered this in one of the other shows, but this is mm -hmm. um, a point where I think we have a lot to learn from, from leaders like yourself because when yeah. a company, especially if it's a startup where you know, usually the founder is the first product lead or the you know, CPO, if you want to make, sound it, make yeah. it sound sexy, how, does, yeah. how did that transition happen? Was it easy? Was it difficult? What, how do you move the center of gravity from the CEO or the founder to bring it to mm -hmm. yourself in that sense uh, for all things product? I think it's, uh, it's really about uh, how do you establish uh, the relationship and how do you establish the ownership areas uh, and how do you retain transparency as well? Like, uh, so ownership here is like being, being very clear about uh, where, what are the outcomes that you are responsible for? Like, um, and then having freedom uh, as much as possible to deliver on these outcomes. Like, uh, so one of the first things that I tried to figure out with the founders, like, and mostly with Siri as well, uh, uh, as well as with JJ, who also joined a few months before me from, from Airbnb, um, is uh, what, uh, what are we trying to build? Like, what's our mission? Like, what, are, what is the key problem we are trying to solve? Like, and then um, also trying to figure out how do we think we are growing, like, you know, how, what are the mechanics behind growth, like, and then based on that, based on this uh, high level uh, kind of 
agreements, shared view on these these things, uh, then I could go and develop the detail on the on the product side, uh, uh, build the teams, uh, uh, make decisions there, and so on. Like, uh, but uh, but there was never a wall. Like um, I, I really don't subscribe a philosophy of hey, you know, this is my turf and this is your mm -hmm. turf. Like, uh, and, and I don't think it, it can ever be effective. Like, so um, uh, Siri CEO was always involved. Uh, uh, but uh, what I am really grateful uh, to Siri that he, this, his involvement uh, uh, was very effective in in, in a way where. Yeah, he could transparently see how things are going and what the decisions are made like. So he could participate in uh, some of the things that he had time and, and uh, uh, kind of, as well as uh, wanted to participate like. He could also voice out his views uh, very, in a very open way like, but he um, uh, kind of uh, left the decision making to the people responsible uh, and either me or the PM and, 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 and so on like. And really intervened uh, in like extremely rare situations, like in terms of overriding the uh, decisions being made and so on. Um, so for me, this is to be to be honest, this is ideal setup because isolating the CEO is uh, I, I don't think it ever ends up well. Yeah. Like uh, that is true. Um, and uh, as well, like I think for the product leader, the CEO can be very helpful. Right, uh, especially to reiterate the uh, you know the common goal that everyone's working against, uh, um, and uh, as well as aligning uh, the rest of the company as well to to that direction to that goal. Like, uh, um, so I think the the experience of working with Syria was was really great. Okay, you also built the team from I think it was initially three when you joined. You were the fourth, mm -hmm. and you sort of built yeah. it to a team of like twenty plus by the time you you left uh, Carousel, right? And I yeah. think you were also in charge of the product design, or which I'm guessing would include the research part of it as well. So yeah. how how did you grow that part of the um, of the team in that sense? Because most as in most stories that I hear or that I know of, the product manager usually ends up going mm -hmm. up the path to become the product leader. And mm -hmm. it, sometimes it feels like the product research part, the design part is sort of not as mature. And uh, so mm -hmm. I'm always keen to hear from leaders like yourself, how did you bring up that part of it to be part of the product management function would you know what were your thoughts around product design was it always you know product design and product management two sides of the same coin or do you feel like they are earlier in the process and then you know product managers are with the execution you know what are your thoughts on that yeah i think um one of the crucial principles of carousel that we established very early on uh was uh, that we will not have for quite a long time a dedicated user research function but as well, we will make uh, research central to everything that we do. Um, so instrumental to that was um, uh, kind of a user research trip uh, quite early on to Taiwan. I think that was the, my third or fourth week in the company where I brought uh, the whole team. And I also brought someone who is an expert um, uh, in terms of design sprints, uh, uh, lean user research and so on, uh, and we did a five five day uh, design sprint in Taiwan, trying to understand the, some of the key problems that we were facing in in, in that market and choosing actually one of these problems uh, for a deeper dive. Why? Uh, but this was also a training session and, and kind of coaching and uh, uh, session for 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 the whole team and for myself as well, because I I, I could also improve in, in, in those five days. And uh, funnily enough, the expert that we brought in was someone uh, who worked for me as a PM uh, at Vinted. Like, uh, and he was much better than me uh, in user research and, and, and uh, uh, especially the hands-on practices and so on. And that's why I brought him to, to, to do that session. Like. Uh, but after, after that week in Taiwan, uh, the, we had key principles of uh, you know, how do you work together. And, um, we knew that product management and product design overlap in terms of understanding the user. That was the key uh, part, as well as you know, generating ideas and so on. PM still responsible to make that final decision what to build, like, but uh, knowledge about the customer and, and so on uh, has to be shared as wide in the team as possible. Like. 
We couldn't uh, uh, involve engineers uh, as much as we probably wanted at that time. Like, uh, uh, but product uh, management, product design, exactly overlapping with research. So we had uh, uh, constant uh, peering of PM and designer talking with the customer, yeah, which effectively works very well because uh, you know someone has to take notes, someone has to speak, so and you do it together. Uh, that uh, makes a big difference when you analyze things together. That helps as well, and you have that shared understanding and shared knowledge in the team by default. Right? Uh, so that was the key building block that we built out in, in, in the team. Right? And then um, I think when, only when we reached 20 people across product management and product design, we actually hired head of uh, user uh, research, uh, whose job was to manage the practice, um, and as well as 20 user researchers that were in place already. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who were all the PMs and then designers. Like, um, so this, this was a bit of an unusual approach, but this was necessary approach in the startup that, you know, lacks uh, funds all the time like that's the uh, and you need to be as wearing as multiple hats as possible and so on like this might not be the right approach to establish company where you know job separation is is, is often uh, important for effectiveness and so on mm -hmm. okay and i still want to sort of carry on this line of uh, thinking mm -hmm. or discussion around building the team because you yeah. are basically someone who comes from europe and you're coming up to expand the team what was yeah. the what were the biggest differences in terms of you know product management either product management practices or cultural differences of well, when you were building the team what did you think was the biggest challenge for you hiring was very hard right? um, uh, and uh, i think overall hiring tech talent uh, being based in singapore is not easy right um, uh, and quite a lot of time you don't find talent in uh, in the country need to bring talent from outside the country like uh, uh, but for product management i think it was extremely hard like because uh, when uh, we were interviewing people with product management experience a lot of people uh, were more of a project managers than product managers unfortunately like mm -hmm. and uh, lacked um, kind of the user focus and our touch with the customer um, uh, in uh, in their past like um, this is just something that we really wanted to have like uh, uh so we ended up hiring from a lot of different places like i i still remember the fact that when we reached the size of eight um uh people in the prior team all eight were from different countries um so we had uh, a person from taiwan we had a person from uh, ukraine we had a person from indonesia we had a person from us uh, we had a person from france as well we had a person from Singapore, I think, uh, uh, India, uh, and um, uh, I think Vietnam, but I might be wrong. Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know, then we we grew even further and and so on. Like, um, and um, I think it, overall it was challenging. Like, uh, and you know, if it's not really about the differences, it's just because mm -hmm. of uh, initial lack of. Uh, I think practice and, and, and expertise in the market like uh, uh, things got easier as, as we went like uh, because um, uh, it also depends on you know how much can you spend uh, uh, in terms of the salaries and, 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 and things like that like um, I saw other differences in other fields like uh, probably more than I saw in product management like uh, I saw uh, for example, attitude towards craft and uh, being very, very good in craft is something that uh, is uh, very strong, I think, in the region. Like, um, so uh, you have people who are extremely strong at their craft like, um, and uh, can be potentially best, best of the best. Like, uh, uh, the flip side of that is that um, quite often uh, the craft is disconnected from the business and the uh, effect on the business like uh, mm -hmm. effect to the customer like uh, um and it is a bit more difficult to get different uh, fields to work together uh and share the same perspective on the same goal like, mm -hmm. uh, um that that was that was something probably more in the other fields not only in product management okay so you saw this more in other fields rather than product management yeah okay yeah. okay yeah. All right. And um, so uh, interesting as well, because you were saying uh, in the early days, it was hard to hire because you, 
a lot of the, well, I won't say a lot, but some of the candidates you interviewed mm -hmm. seem to have the title product manager, but didn't seem to have the, the, the practices right in that sense. So if you were now trying to hire again, let's say you're going to hire in Singapore again, mm -hmm. what would be the things that you would advise, you know, up and coming product managers, what areas should they be focusing on in order to stand out in your book as a product manager? Hmm. You know, I was, I was, and I still am looking at mostly three main uh, things, like uh, which come down to ownership, uh, curiosity, um, and uh, understanding how things work. Um, and uh, behind curiosity is user understanding, user focus, and and many other things. Like, but uh, but that comes down to these three. Like, uh, and. Um, you know, ownership is, is really about have you uh, done something that you own uh, hand to hand, like uh, not necessarily alone, like, but uh, you, and not necessarily as a leader even, like, but you actually felt and established some, some level of ownership hand to hand, like, uh, um, which, for example, with a lot of product manager candidates was not the case because it was quite often someone uh, more, uh, yeah, you know, somewhere in the other office, in other part of the world, deciding what to build, and then Passing someone here on. building it. Like, yeah, yeah, like uh, so. It's not, it's not ownership, like uh, per se. You don't really own and things and hand, like. Um, and know, and I know, I know this well from my own project management experience, like because you ship something and you don't even see the data in terms of you know what you know how does it perform? Is it successful? Uh, how many iterations do you do on the thing and so forth? And uh, kind of proving that ownership is not that hard like you know quite often people build things on the side like um, mm -hmm. um, and um, this could be small things uh, but they still are interested in trading understanding how how, how that uh, works and so on uh, second is curiosity like you know how curious are you are about things like how how deep do you go into your hobbies like or uh, you know areas that you have interest in like uh, and a good signal of that is usually uh, you know does the person have something different to say about the field than mm. uh, majority of people usually say like did they all some kind of different opinion about the, you know uh, self driving cars or whatever it is that they are really interested in like uh, yeah. um, and uh, yeah the last thing is understanding how things work like so this is this is a bit of like you know technical background in a way like but you don't really need to be technical like you need to understand enough like, uh, yeah. and and it's not only about technical side it's also about you know, business side about a lot of other things like are you only like kind of focused on very very narrow or you do you kind of Hmm. understand broader broader hmm. dynamics in the market yeah yeah i think it, it sounds very sort of similar with um, some others who have given their feedback as well so i would say that if you're in a role where it's very narrow where you know for example if your role is pretty much about just you know prioritizing the backlog basically the instructions come from somewhere and your role is just to write it out I would imagine mm -hmm. that that may work for the short term, but if you really want to grow in your product management craft, um, you really need yeah. to have the opportunity to own it end to end to say that I brought it from ideation all the way to delivery. W would that be similar to yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really about you know how do you find opportunities to maybe expand your ownership like yes in your day-to-day -day work maybe you are constrained by someone telling you what to do and then you need to deliver it like um, but you know maybe it's a side project at work maybe it's a side project at home maybe it is something else like uh, mm -hmm. uh, but try, trying to find uh, a way to uh, go for kind of the longer part of the funnel not only on like, you know some smaller part and the repetition is key as well like you know do you do things from start to end or because there's no end with product like uh, <laughs> yeah start yeah. and continue we're, we're, iterate <laughs> i think we probably people are very bad at ending things like this. <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah. One, one day, I, you know, I really hope that I can get, you know, someone from Google on the show and I would love to have a yeah. topic of discussion where we're talking about just killing stuff. Because um, <laughs> as you said, that is one thing that I've really not seen very much in this region. Like even for myself, I don't have um, any experience actually killing stuff. I've tried to kill stuff, never successfully. So, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be great to, to actually get someone on the show who can actually talk about that. So. <laughs> 
yeah this is yeah. This, this is true this is true this is a muscle that uh, i think we all need to do a lot, a lot yeah all right so um the the next step, I guess, the logical question that that I would want to ask you as well is, um, you you kind of took the decision to leave Carousel, um, and mm-hmm. you took a break, uh, I believe, before you actually took uh, yeah. took a role at, at booking. Um, c- can yeah. you maybe you know tell me tell our listeners a little bit more about like why did you leave Carousel? Was it because you know you felt the end of an era, or you know, I mean, yeah, what was it? <laughs> Uh, I think many things like, uh, first of all, it was uh, extremely difficult decision to make. Like, uh, um, and it was not that kind of a flip decision. I was going kind of back and forth from it a bit. Like I was preparing for it like a month. Uh, um, and uh, it's also, you know, hard to s- often say why, because you feel that, hey, this is, you know, this is time. Like, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, you try to rationalize it uh, at that point, then you try to explain it later as well. Like, uh, I think the honest truth, like uh, as this is like an uncensored show, right? It's uh, I I was probably first of all tired, uh, tired after doing uh, yeah, nine years like in startups, uh, uh, a bit less than nine years, but uh, startup work is. Uh, uh, is hard, especially in the high growth environments. Like, mm-hmm. and I was very lucky. I think all three startups experienced like hyper growth, like in, in different ways. But they they are all went you know from thousands of users to millions, uh, um, and uh, the growth was in times like and um, all of them achieved certain scale. Like, uh, uh, and um, I think that was uh, a big driver. Like. I think another another thing is yeah right like it's it's an end of an era like but uh, I think for product leaders they go through different eras like you know I went through different eras like I adapted to different sizes of the companies and so on like uh, and uh, but this was a different company compared to the one that I joined like um, and I joined with the drive uh, to create a global product for mostly like more or less one use case. Um, and we were extremely successful in this region, like, and there was um, a lot of uh, things to do and leverage that success in this region, which meant building more use cases. And um, and that's not uh, something I am extremely passionate about. Like, I'm really, I really love focus as a as a person. Like, um, mm. um, so that that played a role as well. Like, and uh, mm-hmm. probably the final nail to in 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 the coffin, so to say, was. Um, that I had uh, a bit of a health uh, issue at that time. Like uh, I was, I was playing basketball, like, and I tore my knee, like, uh, pretty badly. Like, so I tore my ACL, like, and I knew that uh, there's no way I can, I can heal it uh, properly, like, in the way I wanted, uh, while working, you know, full on in the startup. Like, uh, uh, that that was a very clear realization because it meant that you know I need to do a surgery. I would need to train every day for three or four hours, um, and uh, and so on. So all in all, that you combine these things, it was it was a logical thing to decide that uh, you know two weeks I think after I tore my ACL or three weeks after I tore my ACL, I had a conversation with Surya, and um, uh, we arranged a transition that I think lasted for nearly four months, uh, and. Uh, and it was it was quite crazy like i still remember uh my last day and uh, boarding my uh, flight to uh, us and uh still working uh, on a lot of stuff uh, on uh, the first leg from singapore to hong kong and then in hong kong i think at 10 p.m i closed my laptop and said like done <laughs> that was that was my last day yeah, I can imagine, right? Because you you spend so much of your time and effort to build not just the team, but to build the product. And you know, when it's finally time to say goodbye, there's so many things still going through your head. No, but what about this? You know, and we started that, and and this, and hand over that. Yeah. So, and and it's true, like what you say, right? That the product leaders, you know, and product people, our jobs never end in that sense, right? It just keeps going on, and it just transitions to to the next person, yeah. um, as well. Yeah. But yeah, that that's that's super personal, and I really, again, I know I appreciate you being very open and and very uh, transparent about the reasons, and I really appreciate that. Um, so <clears throat> I'm just gonna go into the last part of, of our of our show, 
actually, uh, which is, um, uh, this is always my favorite part, which is the, the <laughs> song, right? Um, you yeah. actually uh, recommended a song um, called Awake, and the artist here is Taiko. Um, yeah, talk us yeah. through uh, the song. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably less about the song, it's more about the artist. Like, and this is, this is probably one of the best songs by the artist. And now this is also probably the last uh, live concert that I saw this year before uh, all the lockdowns hit and, uh, and, and, and so on. Like, why, why I chose Taifa? I think uh, Taifa represents uh, for me something that is uh, quite often I saw as a key for product management success. And um, I think is the reason behind uh, you know uh, some some of the success I achieved as well, like, which is you know how can you be multidisciplinary, how you can move between different fields, like, and what experience in different fields brings you, like. Uh, so I actually know Taiha from uh, my uh, dabbling the design and being uh, being in the design uh, world of things, like because. Uh, he was uh, he was someone who was known by um, uh, nickname ISA fifty like uh, and uh, he was a designer. He did like a very nice design work. I was very much inspired by him as a designer. And then uh, and that was I think late nineties or, or early early uh, two thousand like um, and uh, and then he transitioned to music world and and did like very well in the music world. He's not super well known and sound like he has his audience like and uh, um, uh, and his kind of he has good music and he has good covers for his albums and sound like so um, yeah, he, he still has the design touch too like yeah. uh, and I think you know that kind of multidisciplinary experience is quite often the uh, key driver for you to be a good uh, product manager. So sometimes you try design, sometimes you try engineering you know how things work maybe maybe you did you know accounting work like i had like a very good pm who whose background was accounting like and then he went to design and then he did product management like um, um but uh, i believe that this kind of multidisciplinary approach is is really helpful like it's not necessarily the only way like but it's uh, it's my way like in this regard and i, I think uh, what is good is to see more examples of this being being successful Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was listening to the song and it reminded me a lot of like, it's almost like the successor to like trip hop and shoegaze, you know, down tempo. <laughs> so it's like, wow, yeah, this, this yeah. is very, very interesting. Um, and that's the interesting yeah. about doing this, right? Because, um, you know, we've interviewed, I've interviewed so many people and all of them have literally selected a different genre, you know, very, very contrasting. And it's so, so interesting. Um, so yeah, um, if you guys, um, the links will be, the link should be up here somewhere at this, at this uh, timestamp or just before. And it's always also um, at the end of the, of the show. So if you guys want to check it out, the video will be there. I highly recommend it because I think the, how they present it live, you chose a live video as well, right? And uh, yeah, how they reproduce that sound to almost sound exactly like they were in the studio. It's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, 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 they're very good. So thank you so much, uh, Andreas. I really um, appreciate the time you're spending. And, you know, obviously it's early in the day in, in Amsterdam. Thank you so much for agreeing. And I also know that, you know, everyone's trying to sort of get back into the norm of things, especially in Amsterdam. You guys are like sort of focusing on adapting to the new normal. So giving me that time is, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on the show, Colin. It's great to great to reconnect with the region, like that I uh, hold in my heart in a very very special place. Like so, thanks thanks a lot. Yeah, and hopefully one day, you know, we're we're gonna get you back on the show. Who knows? <laughs> you may come back as you know a founder or something. I don't know. I'll be I'll be <laughs> sure. so excited to sure. to get you back on the show one day. <laughs> sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was Andreas Baranowskis, um, Director of Product at Booking.com, former VP of Product at Carousel, uh, someone who has really blazed um, the scene in Singapore uh, during his time at Carousel. Um, I actually listened to his talk at one of the festival's uh, product events, and I was really, really impressed. And I, again, want to thank him for agreeing to be 
on today's show, especially all the way from Europe. To all our listeners and viewers, thank you again for your support. If you have enjoyed today's show on YouTube, please like, subscribe. And if you're listening to the podcast, download and follow. And for more information about Product Uncensored, please visit our website at www.productuncensored.com. Until our next episode, stay safe, stay strong, and be happy. Thank you and bye-bye.